Welcome back to my Mental Health and Crime channel. My name is Hoodie London. This is the case of the Idaho quadruple murders. May the victims rest in peace, condolence to the families, and may justice be served. Today, I'd like to go back to the beginning of this case. I want to know how law and enforcement and the FBI got this information of the Hyundai Elantra that was seen near the gas station. The of Idaho in her name and in her memory. Joining me to discuss the very latest in this investigation is Aaron Snell. He's a public information officer for the Idaho State Police, which is assisting Moscow Police with this investigation along with the FBI, and he's serving as a spokesperson for Moscow PD. Aaron, welcome to Sidebar. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. Aaron, what is the very latest? So at this point in time, we're still processing through our tips and our leads. And we're really working on developing a full picture of what occurred the night of the incident and as well the nights before. Uh, we're trying to add context. That way our investigators really have a full idea of what occurred and which direction that they need to go. The last time we spoke when I was in Idaho uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you said the, the picture was becoming more clear. A couple of weeks has passed now. How much more clear is that picture now? Yeah, you know, and uh, we keep using this picture analogy, but it is true. Um, you know, the, the further we get into this, the more evidence that we receive back from our crime labs, we've been receiving it all along now, the more analytics that we have, uh, the more that we're able to see really what occurred. Um, again, we use the word context. We're trying to develop context, talking with uh, the various um, people that were around the victims that night. And we've done over 250 interviews. Uh, so really, we are getting a clearer picture as we go. You know, the question then becomes, how long does it take to have a full picture? We're not sure. This is a very complex investigation, has a lot of different ins and outs on it. And so, um, you know, from the crime scene itself uh, to the fraternity house, to the businesses downtown, um, there's a lot of things that we need to know. And, and there's potential for, you know, a suspect or suspects to be uh, in any of the pictures, any of the videos. And so we really have to review things and, and take a real thorough look at this, at this entirety of the crime. So this is interesting. The FBI and law enforcement were obviously contacting all the people that the victims knew. I guess people that the victims hanged, hanged with that night and they were investigating the Sigma Chi. So a thorough investigation was going on with different different entities I'm sure they were investigating the Sigma Chi boys the fraternity because Kaylee and Maddie were clearly in the corner club and the grub truck, Twitch video. So I'm sure there's a lot that the law enforcement can go through with Kaylee and Maddie's timelines. But I'm sure they were investigating the Sigma Chi fraternity because, because Eaton, Eaton, I've actually heard that many times I, I pronounced the name wrong and I really do apologize because some names are a bit, bit difficult for me to pronounce and I don't think I should be getting too much heat about that because I really truly care about the four victims. Pronunciations is the last that we should bother about when this is such a serious case. Four young lives have been taken so if I misspell a name, I shouldn't be getting heat for that, honestly. Because I've seen it happens quite often in the comment channel. Let's come back to the timelines of the couple.
Eton and Zano were both in the Sigma Chi fraternity party between 8 to 9. But what happened between 9 to 1.45 is the question. Were they at home? Did something happen in the Sigma Chi? Like we've heard rumors, speculations. And not all of it is rumors because it was said by people who were present in the Sigma Chi that something kicked off. And for the police to be saying they were investigating them, we've heard that a couple of times. Why were they under the radar? What was the relationship between the couple and the Sigma Chi boys is crucial. I've heard many people saying that Kaylee was a target. I've heard many people saying that Maddie was the target. I personally believe it was the couple that was the target. The reason I say that is because their timeline is the only timeline that the police asked from the very beginning for the public to help them with their timeline. So where was the couple between 9 to 1.45? What was the relationship between the four victims and the two surviving roommates? The reason that I asked that is because Things could have been going on behind the scenes without us knowing. The way I observe things is that I've been very interested in finding out why Zana asked her father, Jeffrey, to help her to change her door lock, her room lock, or to fix it. What was the reason? Was she concerned for her safety? Was things being taken from her room? I'm just speculating. Another thing that we shouldn't forget is when we look at the layers of the house, on the second floor, Zana had a room and so did Dylan. That means they shared the toilet too. Plus the living room was on the second floor. Was there disagreements going on between the surviving roommates and the roommates themselves? Is that why Zana did not feel, feel safe enough and asked her dad to change the locks. Zana's father told us that he called his daughter the same night the quadruple murders happened. Zana said she was going to stay at home and order some food. I remember him saying she's going to order pizza and she's going to stay at home. Why would Zana need to order food twice? If she ordered food around midnight, why would she need to order food at 4 o'clock or 3 a.m. at night? We all see the the delivery, the delivery package, the brown package with Zana's name written on it. How do we know that that wasn't an old delivery? You know how college students are. They do order a lot of delivery food. We did not see any delivery car coming before allegedly BK's car. So was the delivery from the day before? 
We were told that Zana was on TikTok class. Just because she had a TikTok on, it doesn't necessarily mean that she was active on TikTok. These students could have long be long have been long gone between two to three AM. So was somebody ordering food on Zana's card just to get their just to get their alibi. That is possible. We've seen that in many crime movies. We've seen that in many crime stories, true crime stories. People try always to make an alibi so that they won't be caught. So is that a possibility? We heard the coroner saying that the time of death was at 2 a.m., after 2 a.m. If it was around 4.30, 5 in the morning, she would have said somewhere between 2 to 6 in the morning. She said after 2 a.m. So I believe that's between 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock, something like that. The previous timeline we were given from the beginning was between three to four. From the video, and he was talking about how they are confident, you all are confident, that somebody in that Hyundai Elantra, the white Hyundai Elantra between the years of 2011 and 2013 has information that is critical to this case. That to me sounds like, uh, you know, saying you're confident, you're, you're pretty certain. And it sounds like that vehicle from, we've heard it was in the immediate area and we've also heard uh, through another spokesperson that it was there. Mm -hmm. How close was this Hyundai Elantra to the house? So we, we haven't exactly specified, but we do believe that it was in the immediate area of the residence uh, around the time frame um, that, that we believe, you know, was the night of. And so we think that the occupant or occupants of that vehicle uh, potentially saw or heard or, or know something about this case. And so that's why we put the information out. Um, you know, the information came through tips and leads. And so as we processed it, uh, we think that the occupant has some, some information to provide to us, which is why we put it out. We clearly heard that the information of the Hyundai Elantra came from tips and leads tips and leads. So who gave them the tips and leads? It has to be the public. So who was around the area that saw a white Hyundai with occupants in it? I remember at the start, the police were searching for a 2011 to 2013 white Hyundai Elantra that was seen around the areas with occupant or occupants in it, person or persons in it. So who are the people who gave the leads? Could it be someone who was involved in this crime allegedly and wanted to point out the direction and frame someone else for it? Just a question. We think that the occupant or occupants of that vehicle uh, potentially saw or heard or, or know something about this case. And so that's why we put the information out. Um, you know, the information came through tips and leads. And so as we processed it, uh, we think that the occupant has some, some information to provide to us, which is why we put it out. I've likened the search for this Hyundai Elantra to a search for the needle in the haystack. Uh, we know you've eliminated one of those vehicles as being the um, Elantra found in Eugene, Oregon that had been involved in a vehicle crash uh, that belonged to a woman and it was registered out of Colorado. So you've already eliminated that one. That leaves uh, 21,999 or so to go. Um, so how, how, What's the progress on that? What's the update on working through that list of vehicles? Because that's a huge number of vehicles. And, you know, it, 
is that a nationwide list or what can you tell us about that? So um, I'll be a tiny bit more generic about it, but it is it is a list of, of vehicles that potentially could be in this area. Um, you know, it, it's received through all sorts of different sources and databases. And so as we look at that list, obviously, you know, the ones that could be close to the area might be important. And then as the ripples and, and as it gets a little further out, maybe those vehicles potentially would be less likely to be involved in an incident of this nature. And so, you know, we're able to, as we go through this list, we're, we're looking for, again, different patterns and different trends. And so as we're putting it all together, we're hoping that uh, something will come to light and that we'll be able to use that to move forward. We noticed too in one of the recent updates that about 14 FBI agents have been added to this case. Can you tell us uh, why that number increased from last week to from 46 to 60? So really what we tried to do uh, when we put out those numbers is give people a snapshot in time of what's occurring in this investigation. That's why we update the number of tips and the number of leads and the number of digital images and those types of things that we receive. We would like the public to understand the, the volume of information that we're processing and the number of people who are currently working on this case. So really, um, that's a snapshot in time. So as various projects come and go, uh, those numbers will increase and decrease. Um, and so, you know, saying that we have additional FBI personnel uh, assigned to this case is a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, as well, you know, we have, I think, 25 uh, ISP, Idaho State Police, uh, detectives assigned to that. But those are the ones that are, are here and working on the case. That doesn't include the other uh, ISP detectives and, and troopers throughout the entire state who are assisting in interviews and those kinds of things. So really what we're trying to do is we're just trying to show a picture to our community, letting them know uh, the volume and, and just the, the sheer magnitude of this case. Uh, you know, you have more than 10,000 tips. I, I think the number's hovering around 15,000 now. Uh, that is a huge number. I don't know if people truly understand how much information that is and how much that is to go through. Uh, so how many of these have you been able to rule out as maybe not being uh, fruitful or uh, where are you in that process? So I don't have the exact number of uh, tips and, and leads that we have actually processed through. But what I do know is that a lot of the resources that uh, were we're, we're adding to our group, um, you know, the, the FBI in particular, um, the, the leads and tips go through them. And so there's a process to analyze each and every one of those leads and, uh, and look at and review those leads and then assign them a priority. And so leads that potentially are of, a, of a, you know, that based on other information that we have in the case, um, those are assigned a higher priority and we start working on those. Uh, but we are dedicated and motivated to process each and every one of those and actually analyze them and review them and make sure that um, you know they don't contain something that we really need for this investigation. We truly do believe that there is somebody somewhere out there or maybe information that has already been provided that is going to be the key to unlocking this entire, uh, this entire crime, this entire investigation. I find this to be really crucial in the case. Because if the FBI and law enforcement were de dealing with over 15,000 tips, I personally wouldn't think that they would be going to all the tips. And there were more and more tips coming in. So how would they know if they did not miss an important clue? Because they said that they decide which tips to highlight and to take as a priority, I'm sure which makes more sense to them and that they have more further information about the tips that they got. But what about if somebody is trying to example, I'll say it straight out, what if somebody's trying to frame someone or point the officers in the wrong direction? Because clearly, we heard at the start that the Sigma Chi was being investigated. So what if, just say, 300 tips was coming from the Sigma Chi and another 800 from the other fraternities, blaming it on different people because allegedly, just say, allegedly, they could have been behind it. What happens then? What if the most important tips and clues have been missed in the whole dilemma?
The world searching for 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra. What made it change to a 2015 Hyundai Elantra? Over 15,000 tips is a lot to deal with, a lot to process. That they pulled on and it, it kind of just kept you know, they kept pulling on it and it led to more information. Uh, in your experience, uh, how important is that? Because it could be just one thing or a couple of things that, that really open a pathway to leading to who did this. That's 100% correct. Uh, I truly believe that there's going to be a piece or maybe even potentially pieces uh, of information out there that are gonna connect together, almost like a puzzle. And when they do, it, it is truly going to open up, open up the doorway, and we're going to have a clear direction in which to go. And I think at that time, um, you know, it's going to unravel quickly, and we're going to be able to make determinations. Um, the interesting thing is the information that we already have, the picture that we've already drawn, that will help us as we move forward uh, to really, to really put together what occurred. And so knowing a lot of those things and putting them together already is going to help as well. So we recognize the public would like, uh, you know, a quick end to this and that's what we would like as well. Um, but these types of cases are large and they take time. And so, um, you know, we, we recognize that uh, there's frustrations out there, a lack of information. Uh, but again, ultimately this is a complex criminal investigation and we will provide as much information as possible. And we're always wanting more information as well from the public. Uh, speaking of more information from the public, uh, the family of Zana Carnodal has uh, sent out flyers. Uh, they sent some out last uh, month and they've sent more out this week. Uh, basically just begging people, asking people with any information to come forward, whether it's the tip line, uh, whether it's the digital media upload with the FBI site. So, um, they, you know, they, they sent out, I think, 5,000 or so of these flyers in the mail. Uh, so uh, talk to me about um, how important that could be, because this happened. A lot of people left campus and left town. And, you know, you're saying you think, you know, there's somebody out there that knows something. Yeah, we think it's very important. And, you know, we just uh, we appreciate that support from the family. Uh, we want additional leads as well. Um, you know, anybody that had looked uh, at some of their past social media posts or past pictures and, and think something's out of the ordinary, something's odd. Um, you know, we want that information. I think we've been consistent in saying that, um, you know, the activity that might have been done within those pictures or those videos that uh, people may or may not want to submit to the police, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in the context of the crime. That way we can piece together uh, aspects of this case. If the FBI is interested in any social media pictures, I wonder if they were aware that Dylan Mortison and her boyfriend, Quinn Kelly, deleted a lot of the pictures on VSCO. They uploaded pictures with mask on. Her boyfriend had on a black ski mask. Dylan had on a pink whitish ski mask. So what happened to those pictures? Was social media properly investigated? Where was Dylan that night actually? What was her timeline about? Because we know that BF was in the Sigma Chi fraternity, but where was Dylan at? So was all the social media of the surviving roommates and the four victims, even the previous roommate that moved out, were they all investigated? because they were clearly dealing with over 15,000 tips. They were highlighting some. So how do they know that they, were, they weren't getting false tips? Because this was a huge crime scene. We saw the fraternity boys and we saw four figures running. I keep on mentioning that because that's important. That should have been investigated. We saw four people standing in the Banfield, the Banfield minor alcohol shop. That's true. All the strange behaviors going on in the grub truck video 
And we don't even know what happened in the corner club. Were all those places investigated? Because clearly people were ruled out too soon. They got to the white Hyundai Elantra to Tips and Leeds. Who were giving the Tips and Leeds? Was it the Sigma Chi that were being investigated allegedly? Was it other people, neighbors, other people who could have known important information? This doesn't mean, this doesn't make sense at all because now we are 10 months down the line and it doesn't look like there are much evidence pointing to Brian Koberger except the leather sheet. I've said it before, we don't know if Brian Koberger is innocent or guilty. All I'm arguing and all I'm discussing about and observing is that it doesn't make sense. If Brian Koberger did this awful, horrific crimes, did he get help by someone? Who gave the FBI the leads of the white who uh, Hyundai Elantra? Because let's think, the first one they were searching for was 2011 to 2013. The, the Hyundai Elantra that was on the picture near the gas station had dark screens. It had tinted windows. It looked like someone was sitting behind. And you keep on hear, hearing the police, Ido police mention occupants. So was two, three people seen in a white car? And could Brian Koberg have come on later on around four? I don't think that Brian Koberger did it. I'll tell you, this is the first time I'm saying my opinion why I don't believe he could have possibly done it, but why I believe the chances are very slim that he did it. And I'll say it with facts. If the coroner, if the coroner self said that the deaths were pronounced at 2 a.m., after 2 a.m., Brian Koberger, his car was seen there, allegedly, or was seen there, at five past four. Who called Brian Koberger? Was it one of the surviving roommates? Was it someone that was told to call him? Was he called so that he could be framed? Something doesn't add up here. And if the prosecution was so confident about the information, the tips and the leads that they had, they would have said that from the start. If they were so confident, they would have handed it over to Ann Taylor. Why aren't they doing that? So I think they came to this profile that is Brian Koberger due to the white Hyundai Elantra. The timeline was between 3 to 4. It happened after 2 a.m. We, uh, we heard Eaton, his mother, say 2 a.m., is the toughest time, the worst time for them every night. Why 2 a.m.? And it's, I think I know um, why he did that. Uh, there have been some um, things said about Moscow being too small of a PD to handle something like this. Obviously, Idaho State Police and the FBI are assisting with this investigation. Uh, he talked about the experience of his command staff. I saw some reporting the other day about the lead detective from Moscow only having two years of experience, but it sounds like he actually has more experience than that, at least, you know, two years with Moscow PD possibly, but more experience in law enforcement, possibly military police training and things like that. Um, can you address that? Why, why did Chief Fry feel the need to come out and do that? 
Yeah, I do think it's important. Uh, there have been statements made in, in the public and uh, in media, and the chief really wanted to stress that indeed this was his investigation. This is his agency. Uh, you know, these crimes happened in his jurisdiction. And so he is the chief and he is the one leading these investigations. His command staff has ample experience, you know, 94 years of experience combined. Uh, that's a lot of experience for any agency. And so, you know, they are, they have the right to pick whom they want to be in the positions that they are on the investigative teams. And they have, um, you know, I, the information out there is not always correct. And uh, I don't even think it's accurate when it comes in terms of saying that this agency is too small. It, it doesn't matter the size of the agency. You know, you have a police chief who understands what he's doing. He understands how to get an investigation done and he's able and willing to call in additional resources. I think that's ultimately important. So at this point in time, you have some of the best and the brightest, both from Moscow Police Department, but the ISP and the FBI uh, all working on this case. And so when you have that much skill and, and technolo technological wonderment and, and abilities and, um, you know, you just have the, all that investigative skill, um, you know, that's important. And the chief is the one that had that and brought that all here. And so, you know, when he says we're dedicated and motivated to get this case solved, you know, you have to believe him because it's true. He's willing to bring in those resources that, that can help and assist his agency. I do agree, but I kind of disagree. I'll tell you why. Ido Moscow is a small town. They haven't experienced a quadruple murder to this sense before. The other other biggest cities and towns that do experience mass murders, quadruple murders and such things, more oftenly, they have more expertise and they are more, the more experience you get in your field, the better. The FBI joined this case on the 17th of November. Five days later, why didn't the chief call the FBI from the first second? Because this was an investigation that went beyond norms. They should have got experience. I'm sure Chief Fry is experienced, but I'm sure there are officers and chiefs that are more experienced than him. Experience in the sense with such a horrific crimes happening. Second thing I believe personally is it's easier if they got another if they got another agency involved, for example, 